Welcome back, friends. Uh, another exciting lesson here today as we kind of dive into some uh, deeper truths of, about the Corinthian church. And um, yeah, it, it's been a learning lesson for me too as I walk through this letter and you learn more about what the church was wrestling with. I mean, it was just a mess. It was just a mess, but but it, it shows me God's grace and 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 His love, but also His His um, His calling of Paul and, and His 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 insistence. On repentance and, and keeping his his bride, his church, holy and pure, and and uh, his willingness to walk with people in the mess mess of life. It really is a messy kind of grace, a prodigal uh, kind of church. And so uh, glad that you uh, clicked on today to to watch uh, session session nine. We're making our way through through the letter here in First Corinthians. I'm just going to open off with a word of prayer before we we get into it. Let's pray, shall we? Uh, Lord, we come today. And thank you so much for your revelation that comes through Scripture, that we can learn more about what it means to be a Christian, uh, what it looks like to, to, to walk the way Jesus did, and, and in our world. Uh, Lord, we just pray for insight, for wisdom. Lord, open our, our eyes and our, uh, our hearts, our ears to, to understand and respond and and to know and to hear what the Spirit, what you are saying to us, what you are saying to the churches as we go through uh, 1 Corinthians. Lord, I pray whoever's tuning in, whoever's watching, that they'd be blessed uh, as we dig deeper here today. In Jesus' name we come. Amen. The background. Here we are, the background. So uh, the whole section that we're getting into now is from chapter 8. Uh, right up through to the beginning of chapter 11. And it's all about food being sacrificed to idols. Sounds kind of weird. Um, and uh, based on the way Paul's writing, it's not uh, food or meals that would have been eaten in the marketplace. So like if you go to a Chinese restaurant, for example, uh, um, which is common here for us in Windsor and Hans County, uh, we don't have as many different uh, multicultural restaurants. You go to Halifax, it'd be much different. But if you go to like a Chinese restaurant, they have a Buddha on the wall, and you're sitting there eating um, your, your meal. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, what he's referring to at this time is, is people within the church who were going uh, to different temples and eating meals in the temple that was sacrificed to, to the God, which is what they would have done prior to their conversion. They're converted. They've come to faith in Christ, and they're, they're continuing this practice, and, uh, and, and their belief that they have the right to continue to do this, and Paul does not have the authority to tell them to stop. And, uh, and so what Paul is doing, uh, chapters 8, 9, and 10, is he's arguing against uh, their position. Last week in chapter 8, we learned that uh, he went after them uh, with the line of knowledge uh, puffs up, but love builds up. And so the angle there was like he's kind of like talking to a teenager, or if you're, if you're prepared to a teenager, you think you know everything, uh, but you're you're not considering your other brothers and sisters in Christ, the world that's watching, those who are weaker in the faith. If they see you there, what will that do to them? You know, you think you you think that you know. It doesn't matter where you eat or what you eat, and these and you've learned now from me and, and, and your conversion that these you know these idols, these these idols aren't real, these quote unquote gods don't exist, only the one true God does, which Paul agreed with them, but uh, but you know you're taking this too far and you need to stop uh, engaging and, and participating in these religious meals. This is this is not something you should be doing. You should be loving each other. Uh, and in you know stemming from a love love for God and uh, caring for your brothers and sisters, not not these these pagan idols, right? And so uh, so then in chapter nine he shifts, gets into an interesting passage of scripture. I'm going to be reading from chapter ten today, but chapter nine is is pretty cool. And uh, he gets into a, a defense of his ministry. You think why? Did, how does that tie in? Um, well, they didn't want to listen to him to begin with. What seems to be happening, because if you go through chapter 9, if you want to read it, there's a section there on, on giving to those who were full-time in ministry. So a, a really important passage, but uh, it says, Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple? 
and that those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. I think, why is that in there? Well, um, uh, Dr. Gordon Fee, in his commentary, one of the things that he says is he thinks that Paul was not taking any material goods from them, money or otherwise, to support his own ministry. He was being completely independent, even though he could have, you know, perhaps even should have, but didn't for the sake of the church his, you know, and, and, and his, own, his own calling, even though he didn't have to do that, he didn't. So, and they're, uh, they're using that against him and saying, if you're not even taking what we give you, then you are not a real apostle. If you were a real apostle that we should listen to, you'd be receiving the gifts we've given you. And um, so kind of a, uh, uh, seems to fit quite well with what's happening. A out of that, though, when Paul writes, we get these truths where those who, you know, serve God full-time should receive their living from the gospel, meaning that those, that God's people should be giving, uh, that, you know, we, we should be planning our budgets and, and investing in ministry and people uh, who, who are pastors and ministry leaders and, and to support God's kingdom work in that way. So uh, some churches don't do this well. Some ministries don't do that well. And, and, and we really should. And I say, I say, I'm a pastor. You say, you're biased. Okay. Uh, but it, it really is something that um, uh, we should be doing. You always want to be... Um, providing for those whom God has set aside for full-time ministry. Uh, it says right there, the, the, uh, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel, and that would be a living wage to, you know, to live in this world. And so, so he, he goes uh, through that in chapter 9 and moves into chapter, chapter 10, and that's what I want to read here today. So if you go to your Bibles, we're going we're gonna to read along. Here we are, chapter 10. I'm going to read from verses 1 down to 22. Verses 1 to 22. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not, uh, do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants 
with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Uh, a lot in that passage of scripture, wasn't there? It, the whole section uh, is a warning from Israel history, from Israel's history, that just because these new Christians have been baptized and are having the Lord's Supper, right? They're involved in the, uh, the sacraments, the ordinances, doesn't mean that they can't be led astray like some in Israel were. And so in this chapter, Paul is concluding his, sort of his, his, uh, his argument against their position on eating at these, uh, these religious meals uh, in the temple. And in, in chapter 8, he was arguing more from the perspective of, of the weak who could be led astray watching uh, some of these people, these leaders who were doing that. And then as we move to the end of it in chapter 10, he really starts to confront the ones doing it directly uh, and, and the leaders who are leading those people down those paths. And he, he does it, uh, he's got two different uh, angles as he concludes the argument, no, you, you should not be going to these temples. And as we get into that, there's some truths that, that come out. So, the, so the, first, the first one is that he warns them of the grave danger that they are in. Uh, from verses 1 to 13, he, he, it's basically a full-on warning that participating in this way at these temples, that they are in grave danger. And, you know, you really shouldn't play with fire. It comes out to me. You really shouldn't. Eating at other temples is an expression of idolatry, that, that, that they would be worshipping another god. Paul gives them four examples from the Exodus, and... Uh, the first one's in verse 7, where he quotes the passage, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. That's a quote from Exodus 32, 6. The other three examples, as you move along there down to verse 10, are all to be understood in the same light of this text, because all four are to be understood the same way. Do not be idolatrous. Do not worship another god. What's happening here in the Exodus is that the people ate and drank sitting around the golden calf. If you want to go back, you can read the, uh, the account there. They were sitting and eating around the golden calf. And that act action led to 3,000 Levites being killed and then a plague coming upon them. Um, so it is interesting that with, with the calf there, they start to eat and drink and, 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 uh, and, and engage in things that they should not have engaged in uh, all around worshiping another another god so you start to you stop worshiping god and other things we have gods in this world look different from the ancient world and and and, and behavior and conduct starts to slide away um, the second example is from numbers 25 1 to 9 uh, you know we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did verse 8 um, where they ate in front of baal and then committed sexual immorality and uh, 24,000 died. Interesting, kind of fascinating point there. Uh, it's a bit uncomfortable, but it is what it is. Paul says 23,000 died. You go back to numbers, it's 24,000. It's sort of the infamous 1,000. Where did, how did that happen? We don't know why Paul wrote that. And maybe there's some other tradition that developed later. I mean, we're not sure. Um, but um, the third example, go down to verse 9, it says... We should not test Christ. Some of them didn't were killed by snakes. That comes from Numbers uh, 21 when Israel complained to God that they had to eat manna uh, instead of ordinary food and were killed by snakes. So in a similar way, the Corinthians are putting Christ to the test by eating both at his table and at the table of demons, right? They tested God in Numbers. They're testing him now. Last example, um, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. That could either be Numbers 14 or number 16, where people grumbled against Moses, which really resembles the Corinthians grumbling against Paul, which is a direct sort of affront to God, uh, who called Paul, God who called Moses, 
Uh, Paul starts off the letter, right? That's, it's, it's, a, it's an important verse. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So he's, he's not making this up. He didn't call himself. He comes from God and is, and is, and is God's spoke, spokesperson. So um, it ultimately led to Israel to their judgment of being killed by the destroying angels. So it's a big warning. You see, the Corinthians seem to think that by eating at the Lord's table, they can eat anywhere else since idols aren't the real God, right? They have this false, even magical view of the sacraments or the ordinances. I've been baptized, I, I, I participate in the Lord's table, so they can go anywhere and do anything, and they're good, right? Uh, but when you behave like that, you're not actually worshiping God. Uh, and so, so people can start off, but, but then leave, you know? Um, and their leaving shows something. You can start off in the faith and then leave. Now, I do believe quite strongly that, that once saved, always saved. And what, what I mean by that is that those who are saved, those who are born again, those who have, who have the Holy Spirit will persevere in their faith and won't leave Christ to worship other things. In the words of John, 1 John 2.19, 2, uh, a helpful verse here, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. So, so in Christian understanding and even in doctrinal history, you know, as the church has wrestled with scripture down to the years, not losing one's salvation was always understood in the realm of persevering in Christ, right? The perseverance of the saints. Those who have the Holy Spirit will persevere because they have the Holy Spirit. Somebody who's there, or, or maybe there's some sort of uh, different kind of experience that wasn't a born-again experience that Jesus talks about in John 3, those people can come, come and go. Paul wrote in Romans, he said, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. So you take great comfort in knowing that you're safe in the arms of God, who loves you and has covenanted with you, and has poured out his Spirit into your life, guaranteeing uh, your eternal life with him. And I can read about that in Ephesians chapter 1. But I ha So something similar, I'll try to apply this in a similar way. I have been to, to funerals where uh, because the individual was christened as an infant, um, that they're saved. Even though I can think of one in particular where, uh, and it's not being condemning anyway, it's just, it's just stating reality that I mean, they lived a life without God, and and were even you know atheistic in their in their beliefs and convictions. And but because of the sacrament, the priest said the priests, sorry, said they're saved. And and that's not true. And Paul's words make that clear. You know, you you have to have a relationship with Jesus. Verse thirteen is really helpful here. Verse thirteen is really helpful. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, to people. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. A beautiful verse. Maybe you're feeling tempted. Maybe you're having a hard time when the devil is really, really on you right now. It will not be something beyond what you can bear. God is with you through it all. In light of the, everything that's happening and what he's arguing here, I mean, what he's saying is, there's no risk of them falling, okay? As long as it deals with ordinary trials or temptations, God will help them. God will help us. And God will help you. But, and this is the message of the gospel, really. This is why he says, be, Paul's saying, be careful. But, they must flee idolatry, right? The worship of another god... Because there's no divine aid in testing Christ in the way they are doing. They're playing with fire, right? 
The message is for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him. But if your faith, if you're worshiping another god, then you're not saved. And so this whole issue of idolatry must be appreciated as it relates to falling because you're literally leaving you just don't have a relationship with god if you don't worship jesus if you don't believe in him then you aren't you aren't saved and that's just, that's just the gospel and so obviously the people and the leaders here in the church every it just things went right off right off the, the track and and um and so paul is calling them to repentance now repentance is a hebrew term and it does mean turning from idols and worshiping the living God. And if that's not happening, then they weren't really of us, although they might have been among us for a time. Because he who is in us, the Holy Spirit, is more powerful than he who is in the world. So he gives them a real warning, like, get back to the gospel, <laughs> you know, repent you know get out of this you, you are you are playing with fire and look at the history of israel what we can learn from them to not do that and and in that too it's a really important theological concept i'm not going to get into that too much today but uh in christ and in the church is the fulfillment of all that israel uh labored for and uh um, and so kind of uh, a lot of a lot of rich uh, theology we get into there, but but just practically speaking, you know, Paul is warning them, you know, warning us, like don't play with fire and stay committed committed to Christ. And so he he reaches a conclusion here in the last part, verses fourteen to twenty two, which basically is is him telling them that they are prohibited from going to these places, going to these temples, and being involved in these religious meals. It's incompatible with the Christian life. You can't, you know, it's not something that can happen. And, and the real, you know, uh, kicker, the conclusion, the, the root of the matter, the basis for the whole thing, comes in verses 20 uh, to 22. He says, No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons, too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Heavy verse. Believers under any circumstances are not to be participating in the worship of demons. That, it's basic, but it's important to know. You know, so, so Christians in Corinth should not be present at these meals. Now, for you and for us, like kind of close off your for this session today. I mean, Paul, he stripped this right back and peeled the onion right down. Paul is, is prohibiting, he's, he's forbidding um, any relationship with the, the demonic. And so, you know, like, don't play around with Ouija boards and uh, avoid psychics, palm readers, um, mediums, uh, like any form of witchcraft, you, you don't need those things in your life. These days they come in different ways. Like everything from video games to movies, um, even to novels. Um, and so, you know, be really careful about what you're involved with and involved in. If for us here in the West, we need to learn uh, perhaps if you're in different parts of the world. But for us, you know, the demonic is not as remote and as far-fetched as you would think. Um, and I also think people are a lot more religious, even those who claim to be secular, than they really, really are. I think at its heart, we're all worshiping something or someone. And uh, although it might look different than the ancient world that we're getting into here today, but it's very much alive and well. I mean, you might not have the, the goddess of um, um, Aphrodite like as a little pagan wooden thing you worship in your living room, but the spirit of Aphrodite 
and the need to have certain appearance and look and love is very much alive and well in our culture, if you, if you can hear what I'm saying. Um, and so be wise and be aware. If, if you are attending a ceremony of some type, you know, involved in a ritual of some type, you know, make sure it's consistent with the Word of God. Um, because I do find more and more that we're experimenting with different forms of, of meditation, of rituals. You know, even that may be okay on some levels, but, but can quickly morph into something spiritually unhealthy. Just, uh, for all of us, even myself, just be careful you don't dance with the devil. He's very powerful. Uh, because for Paul and for us, it, it's, it's a question of fundamental allegiance. Jesus said, you can either serve God or mammon, but you can't serve both. I say mammon, he says demons, whatever form that takes. In our world, we have idols of money, of power, of fame. To sacrifice Jesus for that, is to an enter, enter a different spiritual realm. And that's where you need to repent and come to faith in Christ. Sitting at the table of our Lord does not give us, you know, uh, freedom for religious or moral um, unrestraint, right? like, like whatever we want to do. That's not, that's not the gospel. And it's not that God's a legalist. It's that God wants a relationship with you. And like any relationship, if you're into the relationship, and there actually is one, you'll love the one you're involved with. Like a marriage, which is the picture that God gives us in the Bible of his relationship with us. If you truly love your spouse, if you truly love God, um, you'll want to do the best for both him and his people and his family. And so Paul's saying this, what you guys are doing, what you folks are doing just needs to stop, needs to stop. Um, friends, we've reached in for today and uh, those are my few words. I pray that they've, they've helped you in some way. Fascinating passage of scripture, all kinds of cool stuff going on in there. And uh, just stay committed and focused on Christ and keep him first and foremost in your lives. Uh, trust in Jesus. Uh, he is with you, promises to never leave you uh, or forsake you. And so I, I pray that you would be encouraged and also challenged with today's lessons as, and be aware of uh, what is going on around you. Uh, discerning the spirits, the Apostle John will write as well. Take care, uh, God bless, and we'll, we'll be seeing you again for session 10.